Hello, everybody. So we have gotten a lot of interest, to, kind of to a heartwarming degree, about um, what is going on in Iran. And people have really had a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts. We wanted to put together a conversation uh, with someone who was an expert on the area, who has a, a, a history connected to Iran and has been covering it. So we're very, very happy to have uh, Caroline Modoresa Tirani, who is an Emmy-nominated journalist and been covering that area for many, many years. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Mark and Chris, for having me. It's a real honor. And thanks for taking this time and giving so much space to this really, really important topic. Thank you. Absolutely. So just to start, you know, basically, the current uh, protests in Iran are around uh, the death of a 22-year-old woman named Masa Amini. Could you just tell everyone for who may not know exactly what happened, how she died, and why her death has spurned these protests? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Masa Gina Amini was a 22-year-old Kurdish-Iranian woman. Um, she lived about 300 miles away from um, Tehran, which is the capital city. And she was visiting her uncle, who lived in Tehran, um, in September. While she was out on the streets, she was pulled aside, she was detained by Iran's infamous so-called morality police. And these are a group of people that are informally are tasked with making sure that the Iranian regime's um, onerous laws, which often pertain to women, are upheld. She was um, detained for a so-called improper wearing of her hijab, her headscarf. She was taken to a detention centre and somewhere on the way uh, or at the detention centre while she was in custody with the morality police, she was viciously attacked and beaten by the morality police. She slipped into a coma and she died a few days later. The official line from the Iranian government was that this very healthy 22-year-old uh, young woman had suffered a cardiac issue, which is, of course, uh, what we all believe to be an utter nonsense uh, and just another one of the horrific lies perpetuated by this murderous, barbaric regime. Um, a couple of days after her death, on her date of her funeral, September 17th, protests erupted around uh, her hometown province in Kurdistan and Mark and Chris for the last two months they have spread across every single province in Iran. Well, we hear a lot about the morality police. Can you tell us a little bit about who they are and what gives them so much power? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really... It's really sort of interesting because you hear the word police and you sort of think about a um, formal body, um, like the kind of police we think of here in the US. Actually, the um, Iranian morality police are largely informal. They're a volunteer organization, largely. Um, they really came into sort of being post the revolution in 1979. 1983 was when the uh, Iranian hijab law came into place. And anyone who defied it risked either uh, imprisonment uh, or fines or even lashing. You could get up to 74 lashes if you were not properly attired as deemed by these police. Now, some of the uh, people who are a part of this police force, uh, they are doing it, like I say, voluntarily. They forego salaries, but there are a lot of perks. So if you're a part of this morality police kind of um, structure, you can get things like priority for college slots or you can have um, better bank loans or government jobs. So whilst they are in a large sense volunteer and they foregoing like official salaries, there are a lot of ways that they get rewarded in this autocratic structural society of Iran. But they really, really do predominantly go after young women and girls and what is interesting as well, Chris, is kind of there's always a sea change. So depending on who the president is inside Iran at any given time, the um, strength and the, um, the the crackdowns that you see from the morality police can kind of ebb and flow depending on how hardline the president is. Uh, right now, the Iranian president is Abraham Raisi. He's a hardliner. And since he came in at the beginning of this year, the, what we're hearing inside Iran is that the morality police have really set up their policing of women and girls. But I, I heard you say uh, on, uh, I think it was Ben Shahan's, uh, an interview you did with him, that there's a lot of bribery involved as well, that, that, that you can get in and get out of trouble with the morality police depending on if you can pay them at the right time. Yeah, and it's also, yeah, it's, a, it, I mean, as with any organization that really isn't kind of adhering to any strict moral sense of code um, or like legalese, um, yeah, I mean, if you're a part of the 
upper echelons of northern Tehran, which is sort of where a lot of the upper middle class is, where a lot of the uh, children and families of the Iranian regime, where they live. Uh, it's a very, very affluent kind of part of uh, the country. The morality police tend to not stray into that part of town because they don't want to pull over the kid of some really, really, you know, well-connected a member that's connected to the supreme leader or any of the clerics that help really run the show inside Iran. So yeah, I mean, depending on your class or your status, you can kind of get around these things, which again, just sort of underscores why Iranians are in, in part revolting right now against this theo theo oh, sorry, theocracy, this theocratic, um, extremely oppressive regime, which has been unequal and everyone is unequally yoked depending on your class, status or ethnicity. So your grandfather, I've heard you talk about, was imprisoned under the Shah. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what had your family to leave the country eventually during that revolution. Can you talk a little bit about the revolution that got the Shah out of power and how that kind of set the ground for what's happening today or if it did or kind of draw a quick line? I know it's a lot of years, but yeah, yeah. 1979 and now, if you can about Two minutes, no. Uh, if you can, yeah, basically explain, you know, what that shift was and how does that sort of compare to what's going on today? Yeah, so I think maybe just sort of stepping back and, and, and thinking about it from this perspective is that Iran and the Iranian people have been attempting to self-determine for a long time, for really a hundred years. And at various points in history, they have attempted to do so in a way that meant that they saw themselves reflected in their government and that their government didn't seem to be either an extension or an arm of the West, either the UK, you know, Britain or uh, the United States, which it has been at various points in history. Uh, and, and also a sense of being able to um, be more reflective of all of the different um, groups within Iran, because it's not her sort of homogenous. There are lots of different people, Baha'is, Baluchis, Kurds, um, all of which, by the way, have been extremely targeted since this regime came into power in 1979. When the Shah, uh, and, and part of the reason that the Shah was um, toppled, was um, that a lot of Iranians felt that he was a totem uh, of corruption. There had been sustained corruption in the years under the Shah, that he had been become a puppet. You hear this expression quite often of the West. And there was a, a sense as well that um, only corruption was rampant, but that violence against Iranians had become rampant. The Shah had a um, secret police called Savak, and they were brutal uh, in, in violently imprisoning anybody that expressed any kind of dissent. There was also a divide in class between sort of the middle classes and the rural parts of Iran. And so this all kind of led to this really sort of a powder keg, if you will, of reasons why eventually you saw an uprising against the Shah. Um, now, I, I'm not an Iranian scholar, so I, what I say next is I want to kind of caveat, which is that there have been a lot of interpretations as to what happened when people were revolting in the 78, 79. Some people say that they were, that the Iranian people were asking for um, a religious group to kind of come in and really sort of um, represent them uh, as the people in power. Others say that the uh, 1979 revolution was hijacked by religious um, revolutionaries. Whatever your stance, I think what we can agree and what we know is that 1979 was really a dividing line between the dynasty that came before it, which was a monarchic dynasty, and now what we have, which is a theocratic dynasty to a certain extent. Um, I don't think that Iranians have really had the ability to self-determine in either of those contexts. And what we're hearing, and, and again, that's like really important, what we're hearing from inside Iran now are really brave women and girls leading the way and more and more a different cross-section of society coming together and now extremely vocally asking that they themselves be given the chance to self-determine away from a theocracy and away from a monarchy. Now, there have been other periods of mass protests in the last 15 years. What makes this one different? 
Yeah, I and mean, Chris, you're right. There, there have been, you know, Iranians are no stranger to protest, that's for sure. Um, one of the things I think that makes this one different is that women and girls are really leading the charge. So Masa, who was this, I, you know, she was this beautiful woman. I, and just, I, I really want to stress as well, like she's become a hashtag. She's become this sort of totem of a movement. There's this gorgeous video of her. And I urge anyone to kind of look it up. She is, um, her family released it. It's her dancing to Gugush, who's kind of the Iran... Beyonce, Oprah, uh, you know, J-Lo all in one, right? Like she's this like phenomenal um, singing powerhouse. And Masa is there singing along and dancing to Gugush. And she is so full of life and vitality in this home video that we see. And then, you know, juxtaposing that with the video we saw of her and the photos we saw of her in a coma having been violently beaten and then subsequently dying and, and sparking these revolutionary protests. It really should kind of show you a little bit as to sort of what's changed, which is Gen Z ha are here and Gen Z are more attuned to um, their political power and potency in a way I think that the previous generation hadn't been. The previous generation, like my father's generation, were kind of censured and, and sort of chilled by previous political uprisings that didn't lead to any freedom you know it just sort of led to more of the same and so you kind of have people being a bit like actually i want to stay away from politics my dad was like that you know my dad hates that i'm doing this so i hope you both are, are happy um but yeah my, my dad hates that i'm talking about politics he hates that i talk about religion because as you mentioned mark my grandfather his dad was in prison my dad didn't see his father for the first two to three years of his life because my grandfather was in prison when he was born and that was under the Shah and you know this just kind of gives you a sense and that was in the 50s there has been this like tumultuous period of time over the last like 60 70 years where Iran and Iranians haven't been free Chris you that was a long way of kind of getting to this point you said what makes us different this time um I do think that there is a more vocal and more empowered Gen Z that are saying enough. I think the economic situation has deteriorated um, largely over the last 43 years. I think that um, ironically, the Iranian um, theocracy, the Iranian regime actually put a lot of stock in educating women. So female literacy has actually tripled during this period of time. Um, and it's, it's fascinating because they kind of emboldened women to become more intellectual. And yet at the same time, they didn't allow uh, women to have any kind of um, access to the economic marketplace and to be able to rise up in the labor force. So I think women still uh, reportedly earn 41% less than men, for example. So you kind of have this really intelligent female population that are basically stifled. Uh, not to mention, of course, all the other social strictures that they have, like that they are not allowed to leave the country. Uh, they're not allowed to say, I get a passport unless they ask for a man's permission. Um, they are not allowed to get a divorce unless they um, access several different courts. Men can simply get a divorce by just saying, I'm divorced. We're done. Um, so, you know, years and years and years of having this kind of subjugation, I think, has helped lead to this situation. In addition to the economic situation, in addition to the fact that inflation hovers around 40%, um, you know, this is kind of all leading to this very, very potent moment in Iran's history. It's fascinating. I, I do say, I, I thought where you were going with that was that your father was upset because he just doesn't like Chris's movies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I haven't. I should have. Probably not too, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's nice out, so I think he, I think it's good. Um, so, so you know, our government focuses a lot on, uh, and and when we talk to our, the governmental officials, they focus a lot on the uh, Iran nuclear deal, and whether we should join, we shouldn't rejoin, all of that. Do you can you give us a sense of how uh, Iranians feel? Iranians feel about about us, you know, either rejoining or, or pulling out of that deal? Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things I would say is like, it's not for me to say what Iranians inside Iran right. think. Um, but what, I, what we're hearing though, you know, like I can help be a conduit, what I'm hearing from people inside Iran is that at this time it would be imprudent and improper to try and kickstart or resume any negotiations around the Iran nuclear deal. Um, it would, in a sense, bolster the legitimacy of this murderous government, a government that's already imprisoned 14,000 of its people in the last eight weeks, has killed over 300, has murdered over 50 children, that's just in the last eight weeks, um, that has a history of political, um, a cracking down on political dissidents. So I think what we're hearing inside Iran is that they don't want that to be something that happens right now.
There is something that they're asking the West to do, though, and that is to ramp up its uh, ability to call on united organizations like the United Nations to set up mechanisms to hold the Iranian government accountable for these war crimes it's committing against its people. So the, you will hear them talk about the UNHRC, the Human Rights Council, and, and setting up an independent mechanism. So something Amnesty Iran and Amnesty International have been talking about is pushing world powers like the US and like the British government uh, and European governments, and also governments are in, in the global south as well, which are of course important political partners with Iran. If, if the global south really started to um, flex their muscle and say, actually, we want independent mechanisms to hold the Iranian government accountable for these war crimes. Um, I think that that would actually send a, a really strong signal, more so than trying to restart uh, this nuclear deal. If the Iranian government was overthrown, who would take over? There, there are many factions in Iran. Which one would most represent the people that live in the country? Gosh, Chris, I want to swear it because it's it's so fucking hard. So you can probably edit that out. But it's it's really, I mean, it's really it's really hard to um, unpack that for several reasons. One is that um, again, it's not for me to speak on like who should replace this current regime. What I will say is that you're hearing from inside Iran calls to change the regime. There used to be this expression, Marbag uh, Omri Ka, which was death to America. Now you're hearing Marbag Diktator, which is death to the dictator, downfall of the dictator. So there's certainly in the protests we're seeing in across every province of Iran, a groundswell against this current regime. The problem with what the next step looks like, what another government would look like, you know, what could potentially uh, supplant this murderous regime becomes complicated complicated because in 2009 you may have heard about the the green movement right this green revolution and uh, it was a, another moment in the history of the tapestry of Iran where it looked like there may be some kind of change unfortunately what happened after that uprising uh, of progressives and progressive voices inside Iran was the regime cracked down extremely hard. You saw similarly, and although not as, uh, as powerfully as we are right now, but um, tear gas, um, live ammunition being used against protesters and mass incarcerations and arrests. And what happened was that a lot of the sort of leaders of that movement were imprisoned. And during the same period of time between 2009 and sort of now, you've also had a dismantling of labor unions inside Iran. So, you know, Mark, going back to your question about what happened before 1979, you had a much more sort of coalesced sense of the labor or organized labor. Right now in Iran, they, the government have been extremely savvy and I use government loosely because of course they are not really democratically elected. The uh, candidates were handpicked by the Supreme Leader. But the regime inside Iran has really done a very, very effective job in particularly in the last two years of dismantling any labor movement and labor union. So without that sort of like real strength uh, in numbers, without like kind of the millions and millions being able to come out in the streets, we've seen thousands, don't get me wrong, I don't want to diminish any of the hard work, the literal blood that's been pouring into the streets as, you know, the protesters are just remarkable. Like I cannot even imagine what they are doing uh, every day, going up against literal guns to try and protest for basic fundamental freedoms. But I think the reality is at the moment, we don't know what's going to replace it because People in Iran don't have the breath, they don't have a minute to be able to kind of organize in that way because they're at the minute they're just organizing and trying to stay alive because the regime is literally slaughtering them. So I think that's also another reason, um, Chris, why the UN should and I think could get more involved because if we can somehow minimize that bloodshed, it will give Iranians inside Iran more time to be able to organize amongst themselves and figure out what kind of governance they would like going forward, because this isn't something the regime wants to have happen. So speaking to support, you know, a lot of the call to action that we see on social media, maybe it's because it's a Gen Z led revolution is to simply post. How does that help, you know? And does it help? And if so, how does it help? Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing literally from, you know, family members, friends inside Iran, that it really does help. Um, it is, such a huge deal to just know that there is a spotlight on it, right? Like, you know what they talk about uh, in terms of sunlight being the, the, the greatest uh, disinfectant, right? Uh, and the more light that is 
poured onto the situation inside Iran right now, the more that we're posting using the hashtags of the people inside Iran, using Masa Amini, Nika Shakarami, Iran Revolution, um, you know, these hashtags really make a difference because Iranians are really savvy, even though there have been these really dramatic internet crackdowns where the government has tried to suppress their ability to do things like get on Twitter. Um, not that, you know, people here in, you know, the US are talking about like getting off Twitter because of Elon, but like, you know, it really in terms of being able to um, organize and, and organize protests and also get the word out when there are human rights abuses. Um, it's really important that these social media channels remain active um, and Iranians are being able to get around them. So I've been on a lot of Twitter spaces in the last few weeks where um, Iranians have been utilizing VPNs to get on to be able to uh, express themselves and talk about what they are seeing and, and hearing. Um, there are some really amazing, really amazing things that you're just hearing from the people inside Iran when it comes to just being able to express themselves and being able to say, you know what, in 2009, we were really scared. 2009, when we were coming out onto the streets, when the regime had guns, we would run away, right? And like, we would organize to be like, don't go here because this is where the, the, the crackdown's really happening. I just heard, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago from an Iranian, he was like, now we know, it, we want to know where the Iranian um, regime is because we want to get out there and we want to be out in their streets, in their faces. We want to be out there showing them that we have no fear. So it really is remarkable when you can just amplify what they're doing. It's having this morale boosting effect, which I really think we can't discount. And I think I mentioned this to you off camera. You know, in 2008, I, uh, we, I went to go do a documentary on an Iranian uh, rapper named Hitchkos, and then the revolution happened. It wasn't possible for us to get in the country. And one of the things that I, you're seeing now because of what you just said is, and what struck us then was the window uh, on, on the symmetry of the culture of the youth between uh, ourselves. And, and I think, you know, one thing we hope ASP could do is is make people feel a little bit more um, symbiotic with other people, regardless of what the governments uh, do. And, and uh, you know, do you feel that, that maybe what's happening is a little emblematic of, of that, of the people themselves? I mean, I'm seeing things on social media, like dance videos and things like that, that you I never would have quite frankly paid attention to and, and maybe you know, that could continue and how how can it continue? Totally, yeah. No, I think it, this is just like a silly anecdote, but so when I used to go to Iran a lot as a kid, um, we didn't have, when, when I was living in England, I was born in London and we didn't have, um, we didn't have MTV, right? Like I really was desperate for MTV, we didn't have MTV. When I would go to Tehran, that's where I'd watch MTV because the Iranians would be able to like bootleg satellites and like so we, we were we would play Sega we'd watch MTV like this is in like the early 90s so like this kind of cross um this cross-cultural dialogue has been present right like it's there and and I think that you know um Chris like I think if you were stepped out in Tehran you'd be like fan mobbed right like the the the, the notion of this kind of our boundaries uh, and our, our you know the sort of arbitrary boundaries of country lines and political discourse and what's happening with governments that really doesn't affect people and like on a fundamental level being able to kind of relate to a young person your age out in the streets like just dancing simply dancing as a woman unveiled in Iran is an arrestable offense you could be witch you could be imprisoned and now as a result of just in the last uh, few um, few days the Iranian um, MPs 227 of them which are kind of these basically appointed um, like members of parliament they're not mem like congress people like we think of them they don't really represent the people so they just said that any protester should be considered to be basically treasonous and be able to be executed any protester any person going out in the street and just doing like you say Mark like you might think about your kids right or like think about anyone's kids where they go and like have a TikTok video and they're just like living their life out in the street and it's like wholesome, innocent fun. In Iran, that is literally like you can be arrested, uh, lashed or executed. And this is crazy. It's crazy to think that this is how people are living simply to try and express themselves in any kind of way. So I really, I agree with you, Mark, in the sense that like the more we can see ourselves and just basic aspirations for safety, security, the ability to thrive, the ability to kind of nurture oneself, flourish and grow. We can just see that in other people, irrespective of 
the governments that we can't control, right? Like we, we have no control over it. I think that the more that also kind of galvanizes a shared sense of humanity, which is really what we need right now. If COVID showed us nothing, I feel like it, it was that. And I think that if these protests are showing us nothing, it's that the coalescence of shared humanity is, is so essential. I think that's probably a pretty good place to leave it on, wouldn't you say? No, that was very well said. I couldn't agree more. Caroline, or CMT as you've asked me to call you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.